out of the Snake River um, and keep them from being stranded there. So that was yeah, a lot of different things happening this year. In addition to that, bark beetle, which is a common issue that we see here in the Rocky Mountain West, was also um, or has been a historical ecological concern in recent years. But there is a lot being done cross sector to address this problem with stewardship projects involving the Forest Service, um, Sun Valley Mountain Resort, and other stakeholders to actually do some thinning at the ski resort, which is one, reducing areas for bark beetle to um, continue to habituate and kind of spread in. It's creating more skiable acres. Um, it's a great partnership opportunity for the Forest Service to really engage in some of that timber stand improvement. And then the last piece, which we were really lucky here, um, where we were in Idaho this year. So this map, it shows all of the wildfire incidents and events that occurred just this year alone, all of those black dots. Um, the largest fire that we had in the state this year was the Boundary Fire, just under 81,000 acres. Um, and that was about 60 miles north of where we were. And there was a lot of talk at the beginning of the year of thinking a large fire was going to ignite um, in the Big Wood watershed just because it has been a while since we've had a fire and we have some pretty dense forests there and it was super dry. We were really lucky and it didn't. Um, this fire burned mainly in wilderness areas, but definitely did affect some recreational resources as well. A pretty smoky, fiery summer out there. All right, so now getting into the actual people of this community. So this is the southern extent of uh, the Big Wood River Valley. This is the town of Haley. You can see the airport there right in the middle. Um, definitely the most populous town within Blaine County. Cary is just over that farthest ridge. You have Bellevue, South of Haley, and then Ketchum Sun Valley, which uh, the area is kind of iconically known for is about 30 miles to the north. So the Wood River Valley has a long history of mixed uses and some boom and bust. Mining was the first thing that brought people to the area looking for things like silver and gold and molybdenum. Uh, but when those claims dried up in the late 1800s, residents turned to things like logging and sheep herding to kind of supplement those livelihoods. And this is actually really cool because today sheep herding is still a super, super prevalent piece of kind of the social and ecological context of Bigwood River Valley. Um, this is the annual Trailing the Sheep Festival where there's thousands of sheep that literally can run through Main Street. Um, there's some sheep dog herding trials that happen, which is really cool to see working dogs in action. And another thing that I think is really interesting is that Boise and Idaho in particular is the highest concentration of uh, people of Basque heritage in the country. Very random, but it's because um, these Basque people came over in the late 1800s having a high level familiarity with herding culture and also the climate is very similar. Um, so that's still, we see that playing out today. Um, doo -doo -doo. And then moving to what the area is primarily known for, all right, skiing and ski resort. So the first Winter Olympic Games was in 1926 in Lake Placid, and that spurred a lot of interest in winter recreation. And at the same time, we had a man named Avril Harriman, who was the chairman of the Union Pacific Railroad. And he just came out with these awesome new steam engines that could go 10 miles an hour faster and was really looking for a way to increase ridership and basically make that investment worth it. So he decided to make a spur line from the Union Pacific Railroad, which went through Shoshone, about 50 miles south of the Big Wood River, and they made a spur line up to the Sun Valley Resort. The lodge was made in the mid-1930s, and the rest is essentially history there. That's kind of what laid the groundwork for the Sun Valley Ketchum area that we know today. All right. So Blaine County, um, it's a pretty unique and evolving place. You can see here one of only a handful of blue counties in the great state of Idaho. Um, what's also really interesting, though, is that these counties are where some of the highest concentrations of population actually are. So um, I'd say take this map with a grain of salt. Idaho is much more politically diverse than I think it gets um, it gets credited for. But that being said, obviously, um, yeah, one of a few blue counties. The median age is 43, which is just slightly higher than both the Idaho and US average makes sense. A lot of people come to Sun Valley to retire. Um, what I think is really interesting here is looking at these racial breakdowns for demographics. So primarily a pretty white county, but 44% of the school district is of Hispanic or Latino descent. So that really has a lot of implications for this next generation of people and residents of the county um, and kind of how that new and emerging group of people um, and leaders really uh, stand to become, yeah, forces in their community. And then the medium household income is 57,000, which is actually like right on par with the US average. Um, and really where we start to see kind of some breakdowns in 
equity would be the median value of an owner occupied unit, which is $430,000, which is way higher than the US average. And that's because this is a resort area where a lot of people go to retire. Um, it is known as being, um, I'd say kind of anecdotally, a pretty like ritzy part of the state. That being said, um, that comes with its own kind of bag of different considerations um, when looking at this county. Like a lot of places, we're having a big problem with um, housing and affordability right now. Uh, there's a high number of vacant units in Blaine County, and there's been a 7% population increase in just the last year alone compared to a 1% average growth rate uh, year over year for the past 20 years before that. The population is just over 23,000 as of 2019. This graph here on the right just shows Blaine County there in red, right going up, all the other counties going up as well. Bridget mentioned this in her uh, presentation that Colorado is the sixth fastest growing state. Idaho is number two, um, so yeah, but not really. Um, so just some things to consider, and it's definitely caused a lot of uh, interesting conversations and challenges, and I'm really excited to see what the state does to tackle this, because it's obviously a great place to live, but we've got to figure out how to manage all these people. Um, and this brings us to my partner organization, the Wood River Trails Coalition. Um, so our mission is to be a trail stewardship organization that works to create, maintain, and sustain trails for all users. So we are looking to create opportunities for hikers, for mountain bikers, for dirt bikers, horseback riders, adaptive cyclists, um, anyone that wants to get out there and use a public trail. All right, so some work that we do. We do a lot of volunteer events, uh, as well as we have memberships um, that people can opt into. These are completely based on what you feel like is an appropriate amount to give. We don't have like a minimum or a maximum, anything like that. Um, but these are just some photos of what volunteer events typically look like, but they're a lot of fun. We meet at the trailhead, we provide all the tools. We usually hike out a mile to three miles. Um, and we do things like building erosion control drains, trimming back vegetation that's growing into the trail to make a very clear corridor where people wanna go. Um, we close down social trails that people make alongside. So eliminating that kind of braiding problem. Um, as well as doing a little bit of log out, just depending on what the project is. And then we usually meet back in the parking lot and have some pizza and some beer, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Cool. Um, we also started getting into trail etiquette and education this year, just with the increase in people. And we're starting to see, you know, nationally a trend of a lot more user conflicts happening on trails. So this was our Mountain Manners, Ma Mountain Manners Matters campaign. <laughs> um, and like we learned in our program, graphic illustrators are a really, really awesome set of people and just set of skills to use to communicate things like this. We have posters that look just like this, giving all sorts of tips about just, you know, what is a, you know, how can you be the most respectful you can as a trail user and deal with things like horses and bikers and mountain bikers, dirt bike riders and whatnot. Um, and we had these posters up at all the trailheads you can see there on the left. And then we also had them in bike shops, hotels, um, other places like that. So that was a cool kind of outreach campaign that we got into this year. Um, and I think one of the most, uh, probably the most significant thing that we do is the professional trail crew support and the relationship that we have with the U.S. Forest Service here. Um, so each year we, through a collection agreement, uh, fund the U.S. Forest Service Catch and Ranger District professional trail crew with $40,000. And this supports multiple trail crew positions and expands the federally allocated capacity for trail management in the Wood River Valley. Without our collection agreement, they would only be able to have a crew of about two to three people to manage about 400 miles of trail. So with our collection agreement, we can actually expand our crew to be like six or seven people, employ more, have a better maintained resource. Um, so this partnership, I think, is something that we really pride ourselves on. And it's really cool because three of our four staff have actually all worked on the Ketchum Ranger District Trail crew in the past. So that relationship is, uh, is really strong, really great. So here's me and some of my compatriots out there on the trails, uh, fixing the drainage ditch, peeling logs to build a bridge. And then this was last year, working with the youth crew um, to, as you can see, reroute on a huge avalanche slide that happened. All right, and this is just a little information kind of about the work that we were able to get done this year. Um, so we had 14 vol volunteer events, just under 900 volunteer hours. Um, and then I think the trail feature stats, if you're not someone who's like done trail work before, you might look at this and be like, okay, that's cool, but why does that matter? Um, so you can think about it, right? There's a thousand trees that we remove from a trail each season. And every time a tree is down, usually bikers and horseback riders, it's not very convenient to ride over. So they're gonna ride around it. And if you think, you know, say 25 square feet a uh, previously undisturbed forest ecosystem um, is disturbed because that tree is down and no one clears it. You multiply that by a thousand and you multiply that year over year. It ends up being quite a significant amount of landscape that's disturbed if people aren't out there keeping the trails 
um, in good shape. And that's just from an ecological perspective. Obviously, these trails and outdoor recreation supports um, a huge amount of economy in Blaine County and the Ketchum area. And then as an organization, um, we had a fantastic year for fundraising. We had double or triple digit increases across all of our budget areas through some extreme generosity of some anonymous donors. And it's actually how I was able to get hired by them. Um, so thank you, whoever you are out there uh, for supporting our organization, what we do. Um, we were able to hire two new staff and then a really cool project that we were able to engage in this year, the Adams Gulch Adaptive Sports Trail Enhancement Project. And what that is, is basically going through extending um, a piece of a really popular flow mountain bike trail. So a bike trail made specifically for downhill mountain biking to be wider and also um, have appropriate features for adaptive hand cyclists. We partnered up with a local um, adaptive sports nonprofit based in Ketchum to do this project. And we also are replacing all of the bridges at that trail area. This is the most popular trailhead in the Valley um, to be wide enough to support those adaptive hand cycles. We're proud no. to be able to support work that is offering opportunities for um, I think a really forgotten piece of outdoor recreation. And we're one of the only places in Idaho that's getting up to that. So that's awesome. All right, and here we have the Capstone Project. So it was the Wood River Trails Coalition's 2021 Trail Use Survey. The vision was to conduct a comprehensive trail surveying effort on designated national forest trail systems in the Wood River Valley. And we wanted the results of this to build capacity for future trail management and programming. And I know we all kind of have a pretty good idea of what building capacity means, but for those of you at home, or if you just want a little more explanation, we think of building capacity as taking the resources that we already have and making them work better, being more efficient with our dollars, um, making the best outcomes possible with the staff that we have um, and really making sure that we're putting our resources where they're gonna be used most effectively. So goal number one was to collect reliable, accurate counts of trail usership at specified locations. And we wanted this data to serve as a baseline for future trail surveying efforts, because as you'll see soon, this data is really cool to look at for one year, but it really gets more powerful when you have your year over year comparisons to have and show it to. Our second goal was to administer trail use surveys to the public throughout the 2021 summer season, providing the project team with relevant demographic patterns of use and trail preference information. And we were hoping to collect at least a thousand unique responses. And then the third goal is to create a standard survey methodology that's easily replicable and matches resource capacities for 2022 and beyond. Awesome. So how did this project come to be? Um, so in 2012, the Wood River Valley Trail Study was conducted and it was a very similar project to this using actually the same kind of infrared counters, also some surveys. And this was done by Blaine County Recreation Department and Sun Valley Economic Development. And those results um, were really great to have. And it turned out to be extremely valuable because the next year we had a huge fire that basically destroyed like 70% of, or I should say affected 70% of the trail system on the Ketchum Ranger District. And so having those metrics when the uh, Forest Service went to go to apply for additional rehab grants, being able to, you know, as we all know, grant writing gets more effective when you have data to back it up. So it was pretty great timing that we had that information to really lobby and advocate for ourselves. Um, and then, yeah, 2014 to 2018 was a lot of rebuilding of the area. And then last year, um, it was kind of identified that it might be time to do an updated survey just because so many more people had been moving to the valley. Anecdotally, we've been hearing but a lot more issues of conflict on trails, parking availability issues, um, people just kind of feeling more congested out there. And so the Forest Service took a really big interest in this project at first, but knowing just unfortunately how the government works, it's very slow, it's very bureaucratic and um, not very flexible or adaptive. So they reached out to their great partner at the Winterberg Trails Coalition and said, hey, could you guys possibly house someone to do a survey project or do this yourselves? And I'm sitting here like, hey, I have a capstone project to do, let's do it. Um, so yeah, got together and used that pre-existing relationship to come up with this project idea of doing an updated survey um, and getting some updated metrics. We also then in the spring started to reach out to another nonprofit catch on the Environmental Resource Center. And we were really excited about this partnership this year. There's someone who we hadn't as a Trails Coalition done a lot of engagement with before. Um, they work primarily in, as we see like, dog waste management at trails, invasive weeds, um, just general environmental education that go into like all the fifth grade classrooms across um, the whole county and do different environmental education initiatives. Um, but they reached out to us saying, hey, we have these summer fellows that are coming in. So kids in college, I should say young adults in college and some of them out of college who are doing 
uh, basically three month long internships with them. And they said, your project sounds like a great opportunity for them to get some applied experience in conservation research. So the summer fellows helped with things like actually administering the surveys with me. A couple of them went out and grabbed some trail counter data. And then some of them also did some ground truthing work, which you'll see why that was really important in a little bit. But yeah, really happy to have them on board for this project. We also had help from the National Forest Foundation. The National Forest Foundation is kind of like the friends group of the National Forest Service. Um, and they were actually the ones who provided money to purchase the infrared counters um, for us to do this project. And then finally, we have kind of an unlikely but still very valuable partner for this project. Um, we had a real, real estate company that decided they give 5% back of all their commissions every year to a local nonprofit. And they identified us as being a great recipient for, um, for that funding. And that funding actually was able to pay me for my work over the summer, which was really, really great to just see kind of the broad support on the community level of value and interest in trails. So thank you, Ricks and Cronin, love your realty. <laughs> All right, so the quantitative component of this project so you can see here, these are three photos of the Trap X infrared trail counter that we used to actually get numbers and quantify total trail impact. Um, they attach to a tree. They usually are supposed to detect people right around hip level. They can detect dogs if it is within that beam range. They can detect wildlife, um, but they also, you know, they can catch mountain bikers, dirt bike riders, hikers. Etc. Timestamps everything, and with these trail counters comes an amazing software package that you can use online to interpret all the data as well. And you'll see some of those graphs here in a second. So we had six counters total at 20 locations and 782 combined days of deployment across the whole trail system. Like I said, it detects all user types. They're really convenient for long-term use because they have great battery life. They're good in all kinds of weather and temperatures. We're actually going to pilot some of them this year on some backcountry ski tracks out there, um, which is pretty cool. But they do have some limitations, right? So they're, they don't distinguish between directionality. So when someone goes out, that's gonna be a count. And when they come back on that trail, it's gonna be another count, which made for some really interesting analysis of the data and trying to get total user numbers. Um, and if anyone would like to really get into how I did that, just grab me after and we can talk about it, but um, I won't get too into that right now. They are, like I said, sensitive to animals. That's another consideration um, that we kind of learned about in this year one of the project. And then the ADT stands for average daily total. And what that means is the counter will make an average based on the days that it was actually out there and take all the counts, give you an average daily total and use that number to extrapolate into like weekly totals, monthly totals, seasonal totals, et cetera. Um, so, that being said, the longer that a counter is out in an area, right, the more confident we can be in that average daily total. And then correct placement is really key for these counters. Um, you can kind of see through the green, but there is a pretty wide trail back there. And what we discovered is that um, you have to be strategic about where you place this so it actually hits you know, the accurate number of users here, you can have people walking three to line side by side or riding no problem. So it's only gonna detect one person as opposed to three. So just some kind of, um, I guess, new challenges and unexpected things that we learned in year one of this that we're definitely gonna take into consideration in future years, but yeah. Um, cool, all right. Next, we had the qualitative component, a form stack survey. We went with the form stack software because it is able to be used offline, which is really great for our project area because a lot of our trailheads are not in cell service. So we needed something that was gonna be able to collect responses um, and then upload them when we got back into Wi-Fi. So it was a 17 question survey. It was about five minutes to complete, totally anonymous. We used intercept and then also QR code distribution methods. Um, what we found though about August, we were not getting nearly as close to the 1000 mark that we wanted to for responses. So we had to employ some adaptive management there and start looking towards digital distribution methods. One reason we didn't do this from the outset is because some of the questions on the survey ask about the trail that you just used. And so we really wanted to catch people right after they had been out there to get their most accurate perception of what was going on, as well as just provide some great exposure for the organization um, and really get us out there talking to the public. Um, so yeah, we started moving into the digital distribution, putting in newsletters, sharing with the city of Ketchum, they put it on their Instagram story, things like that. And we actually got to like double our response rate within a month, which was great. Um, we had it out, or we surveyed people at nine trailhead locations over 17 distinct days. Um, we asked questions about demographics, patterns of use and engagement, and then trail design preferences. 
And these are just kind of some of the questions um, that we had. And I'll say too, just kind of a learning moment, right? One of the questions was, which of the following trail systems is your favorite to use? And the way that we thought about this as the kind of project team was, oh, this is a trail that someone's gonna be using the most often. We can cross-reference this with the counter data, but favorite to use and visit most often are definitely two very different questions. And so that was something that we kind of realized partway through and we're like, okay, we'll do that differently next time. Um, but yeah, just some considerations. This was a Likert scale matrix of all sorts of different trail characteristics. So things like proximity to your home or lodging, parking availability, opportunity to experience wildlife, avoiding areas of extensive wildfire damage, um, and kind of asking people to rank how important is are each of these characteristics when you go out to choose a trail. And then this was our crowding question, which I think was really interesting. We decided to ask people how many people do they think that they encountered, and then ask them, did that feel crowded, um, to really get an idea of what does this unique place and set of people think is a crowded level? Because here, right, like I should say in Idaho, encountering 20 people, a lot of people said that felt crowded, but here on the front range, if you encounter 20 people, you're like, dang, I had this trail myself today. This is great. So just kind of really tapping into what, um, what are the perceptions to this unique place? All right. So these are some of our results of the actual total trail impact. So this is the total number of counts that counter is detected. Um, you can see the data on the left is in 2012 using the exact same kind of counters and then the data on the right. So overall, we had a 66% increase in impact and use across the sites. Places like Fox Creek here saw a 223% increase, which just really speaks to, I think, how outdoor recreation is rising in popularity as well as just general population growth in the area. Um, so yeah, definitely an increase in use is what we've seen. And again, this is total trail impact. These are not like numbers of users. This is just the number of times a counter was engaged. All right. So getting into kind of an applied example of how we use some of this data, we'll look at the Baker Creek drainage. So Baker Creek is in the northern part of the project area. We had four trailheads that we were looking at there. Um, and I think the one that really surprised us is this this blue one here, Alden, um, it's a relatively inconspicuous trail. There is no parking lot. There is no trailhead kiosk. It is just a post and you can see it on a map um, and you can ride to the top of it from the main dirt road or you can take a separate dirt road and get shuttled and then just ride your bike down it. It is a very popular mountain biking trail that is open to all sorts of different kinds of uses. Um, but we saw a ton of use there for a relatively inconspicuous um, trail and this, gets at how we can analyze human behavior and social components based on quantitative data. So you can see like Osberg there in the orange and Baker Lake in the black, those two trailheads are only 50 yards apart. And we have saw way, way, way more use at Baker. And if you cross-reference that with the survey data, one of the most or highest rated things for importance was having a variety of terrain, terrain types. Baker Lake, you're going to an alpine lake. Osberg, you're just hiking in the woods. So we think there is some um, kind of directionality there if you consider both sets of the data. Um, and then looking at some of the other graphs that the software is able to give us and some information, hours of the day use. What I think is really interesting here is that Alden, right, it's also like 40 minutes from town. Um, we have people using it all the way up until 10 p.m. at night, and we're really confused about what's going on there and definitely want to do some more exploration into this trail system in the future. Um, what we think is that that dirt road, Baker Creek Road, is really popular for dispersed camping, and we think that maybe people in the area are like taking a post-dinner stroll and see uh, this inconspicuous trail post and trailhead and maybe walk up for like a mile and then turn back around. And while that is impact on a trail, it's hard to justify that as a total trail user day. So next year, we're gonna be a lot more strategic about placing that counter maybe halfway down the trail or one at the top and one at the bottom and really getting a better idea of total trail length impact and use. Again, to could be animals, we, yeah, don't know. So we'll get out there. But in general, um, for the scope of this project, we did all the analysis for uh, days from Memorial Day to Labor Day. This is what is considered kind of the peak season. Um, and this is the estimated number of trail user days that we saw across all the sites that we studied. Um, so yeah, some things to keep in mind. It's not all the trails on the Ketchum Ranger District. It's not the full winter use season. So you have people out there in April and May, and of course, September, October, November. Um, and the counters weren't at the trails every day. So remembering that average daily total, and that was the metric that was used to come up with this estimation. 
Um, so it's likely probably an underestimation of what's actually going on there. And then just some comparison, the most recently available data for skier days at Sun Valley, just over 400,000. So skiing is probably still the more popular outdoor recreation pursuit in the area, um, but trail use is definitely strongly behind in rising. All right, so now getting into our survey results, uh, we were able to get 508 complete survey uh, sets to analyze data from. In general, most of our respondents or the majority were full-time residents. We consider that six months or more living in the Wood River Valley. Um, and then an even split between part-time residents, that three to six month range and visitors and tourists. Uh, the number of years full-time, this is a follow-up question. So I really like using the Formstack software because you were able to add in that logic questioning, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, so asking one question, depending on how you answer, it shows you a different question suited to that answer. So if someone said full-time, we asked them how many years. Um, and we have most people in the 20 plus year range, but also pretty interesting. We've had a lot of people, right? Five or fewer years that have moved here recently. Um, and this kind of information for us as a nonprofit, when we talk about outreach and communication, how we're spreading our message, where are we doing events? Who are we reaching? Um, this kind of information is really helpful. And then in terms of visit frequency, we have a lot of people who are regular visitors to the Wood River Valley. And then we also had a lot of people this summer who were first time visitors. So that's pretty cool too. All right, so some resident demographics. The average respondent age um, was right around 51. We had slightly more females take our survey than males. Uh, we did offer transgender and non-binary as choose responses, but no responses were received. I think also what is really interesting is the racial breakdown. If you go back and think about, right, 44% of the school district identifies as Hispanic or Latino. And we had less than 1% answer our survey identifying as Hispanic or Latino. And what also is interesting about this question is this was a write-in. This was not a select from the list. This was how people self-identified. Um, we had some pretty interesting answers for other as well. So people were pretty uncomfortable sharing um, their racial background, which that's, that's your information to share, but for an anonymous survey, I found that a little bit interesting. All right, so our respondent user types, uh, the majority, right, using trails for hiking and walking, then followed by mountain biking, which for our area is not surprising, a very bike-friendly community. Um, horseback riding was actually our least number of recorded responses, but I thought this picture was really cute, so I included it. Um, so yeah, we service, right, as an organization, all different user groups, um, and this kind of shows us a lot of what we already knew, I was pretty surprised to see how many trail runners we have out there. And that's gonna be interesting in the future to look at, okay, how do you define yourself as a trail runner? Is there like certain um, use types or trails that you go to because it's a trail running trail? Um, yeah, so just some interesting considerations. Other responses included things like dog walking, um, access to fishing and wildflower viewing in the early summer. All right, and this is our question, analyzing crowding perception. Um, so just kind of walk you through what's going on here. So if it's under, if a respondent reported seeing under 10 people, in general, the majority of people said, nope, that's not crowded. I'm cool with it. We're good. Um, when we start getting into that like 10 to 20 range, we start seeing more vari variability of people saying, yes, this felt crowded um, or, you know, no, it did not. And then of course, when we get over 20 people, we have um, more and more people saying, yes, this did feel crowded. And this kind of information um, has a lot of implications for things like outfitting and guide companies, hotels that recommend hikes to uh, different people. And just having an understanding of, right, okay, you have this size group and you want to do this kind of, um, you know, hiking or trail activity. This is a good place to go for your size if you'd like to uh, avoid any kind of conflict with other user groups. All right. I want to show this slide just to show kind of the integration that we were able to do with the qualitative and quantitative data. Um, so when we asked people to report the trail that they felt crowded on, um, the Adams Gulch and Taylor Canyon trails were reported as some of the highest. Um, and what's really interesting is that star indicates 10 people. So right around where we start to see more variability in people's acceptability of crowding. And you can see that for most of the day, um, at both these locations, right, it's over 10 people. So that really aligns well um, with the data that we're seeing. This, these graphs here on the right are from the traffic infrared counters, so that quantitative data. And then this uh, trails our respondents perceive as being most crowded is that qualitative data. And then we also had people saying the 
Chocolate Saddle Trail um, was pretty crowded and we had the Idaho Mountain Express local paper do a big write up about some issues that private landowners are having there. It only has about four parking spots on the trailhead and people start to park on people's yards and blocking driveways because they want to go hike there. Um, and so this is definitely a very prevalent, timely issue. And we think that the survey data and then next year putting counters out on these trails is going to be a really valuable tool for figuring out how to manage this. And then if you think back to that uh, trail preferences matrix, the number one thing that people uh, said was very important is opportunity for solitude. I don't think this is surprising given the circumstances we're in now with COVID, people looking to get away from people, looking to find uh, recluse. Um, variety of train types is also very important. Sufficient challenge and complexity of features, time of year, and then the ability to loop or lap a trail. What was really interesting is the least, uh, or I guess I should say the characteristic that received the most not important at all was parking availability, which everyone talks about all the time being such an issue and apparently people aren't that bothered by it. So um, yeah, it's kind of funny what's going on there. In addition, um, people were very neutral about avoiding areas with extensive wildfire damage. Uh, that's something that I always try to do because one, I don't want to get hit by a dead tree falling and two, there's no shade. So um, yeah, just interesting to see that people aren't as deterred by that in this, uh, for this respondent set, I should say. All right. And then finally, where do you get your information about Wood River Valley trails? And this, I think, really just speaks to how rooted in place um, a lot of our trail use is and really how tight-knit this community um, this community is when they operate in the outdoor recreation sphere. The Blaine County Recreation District Summer Trail Link website, which is a privately held um, online mapping website, was the highest ranked uh, location of finding out information about the trails. And it's a, it is a great website if you want any kind of example of, you know, what you can do with data and natural resource management, because this doesn't just have trail conditions for like, you might encounter snow, you might encounter mud in the early season, but it also records information about where are the sheep bands hurting right now, which is definitely a factor you don't want to run into on a trail is like a thousand sheep coming down a gulch. <laughs> um, so yeah, just kind of interesting that uh, the community really values this, this resource and it's something that we are looking at closely as an organization and how we can invest in this uh, piece of technology more in the future. Additionally, word of mouth and others was the next highest rated um, information source. So again, just speaking to the Titan community and how much potential there is in tapping into that locally and already held um, knowledge base that we have. All right, and then um, about three weeks ago, I gave a presentation very similar, kind of somewhat similar to this one um, at the community library in Ketchum, diving a lot deeper into the data behind all these different trails. I used a lot more examples of crossing over um, the quantitative and qualitative information, but it was very suited to that community because I'm gonna reference a lot of trails that if I talked about it here. You guys would be like, that's cool, but <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Um, but that being said, it was a great event. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have anyone in person. It was just online, but we had a good turnout. Um, and we had all the project partners here answering questions from the audience online. Um, yeah, it was a great event. If you wanna check that out, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch it there. All right, so thinking about, um, I was zooming back out into conservation sphere as a whole. What does this kind of data mean for conservation in the Wood River Valley? Um, I wanna talk about or tell a story about Taylor Canyon. So if you remember back, our partners, the Environmental Resource Center, one of the things they do is manage dog waste. And how they do that is they have these special bins um, at each or a big variety of trailheads in the area. They're just used to collect dog waste. They give out free bags. And the reason they do this, right, is because over the course of the year, over 15,000 pounds of dog poop are collected just from these bins. So that's just people doing the right thing and putting it in a bin, not to say all the other dog poop that is out there. And all of that poop just gets run into the streams and into the water system. And for an area that is already experiencing such extreme drought and is so, um, I guess, isolated, I should say, in its resource, it's really, really important that we avoid um, contaminating the water with things like E. coli and other bacteria that dog poop and waste carries. Um, so this summer, the Environmental Resource Center was saying, hey, we have an extra one of these bins. We're not sure where to put it. Um, and they remembered that we were doing the survey and with these counters. So they reached out to us and said, hey, where are you seeing a lot of use right now? Is this a location where there isn't a bin yet? And sure enough, Taylor Canyon, a trail that used to be just kind of a more undercover trail, I should say. It's like not, you can't see it from the road. It's not highly publicized. The parking area is like at an angle like this. It's yeah, sketchy and out there. 
but it's become super popular with the dog walking community. So um, they reached out to us. We said, yeah, we're seeing a lot of use there. You should put a bit out there. And they went and did. And they've collected, uh, I think, almost 100 pounds just since they've um, had it out there for the last few months. So that's just a really, I think, good example of how this project allowed us to be adaptive in the way that we collected data, as well as you know the importance of collaboration and forming those partnerships with other like-minded conservation and environmental groups in the area. And then really just getting at um, the social ecological systems order about like dog walkers not going away. Um, we need to figure out ways to both allow the use to happen, but in a controlled way that's protecting ecological integrity. Um, additionally, right, outdoor recreation, a huge thing for the state of Idaho, and you remember back, it's growing quite a bit, um, and it brings in a lot of economic income. So it's just really important, again, that we figure out ways to allow the recreation to happen, to allow these livelihoods to be supported, to allow these um, really cultural aspects of the landscape to exist, but at the same time, use this information um, to manage the resource in a way that everyone can have a positive outcome. And one of the ways that this is happening over in Boise, their Ridge to Rivers program, which is kind of similar to who we are as an organization, actually just started a pilot program last year of certain days of the month, depending if it's an odd number day or an even number day, uh, certain user groups can use it and they can travel in certain directions. And this is done to prevent conflict and kind of spread out impact across the week. And they decided to do this project based on a survey that they gave as well. And from what I heard from just people visiting from Boise this summer, it's been a really big success. Um, so looking at, you know, how can we replicate some of those models that we're already seeing um, and kind of learn from each other. Additionally, I think that this data has a lot of potential to be cross-referenced with Idaho Fish and Game data. Um, there are wilderness study areas and a number of just already established wilderness areas surrounding the Capstone Project site. Um, and there is definitely collar data out there for elk and wolf. So again, looking at how can we allow these two groups and forces to coexist in a way that produces positive outcomes for both. And then finally, uh, we really want to be a model for other mountainous resort communities or just mountain towns, um, looking at ourselves as a proactive group rather than a reactive group. Um, and we have definitely looked a lot at what, you know, things on the I-70 corridor and things happening in Colorado, um, the strategies that they've used to manage outdoor recreation and kind of an increase in population. And we would like to do that here in Idaho uh, in a place where we already know we have a community who's willing and engaged um, to get involved with this kind of stuff. Cool. All right, so some recommendations that I have for the Trails Coalition. Um, keep doing the survey, which we are going to do next <laughs> summer, and expand it to include more counters so we can have them across more trails, but also just get more days out there so we can be more confident in the data that we're collecting. Um, again, want to keep focusing our programming and data-driven decision-making. I think this project really proved to me that you can employ research methods and collect data that can be used very quickly to make important decisions. It doesn't necessarily need to go through an extensive five-year study period. Um, in this particular community, collecting data and using it to make decisions um, we've proven is a successful tactic. We also want to explore ways to integrate this data with the uh, BCRD summer trailing, since we know the community really values that and uses it a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for updating use throughout the summer um, at certain trail locations based on the infrared counter data that we're getting showing, you know, this has been very busy. Maybe you don't go to this trail this particular time of day. Um, and then finally, looking at the big glaring question of diversity, equity, inclusion in outdoor recreation, and especially this um, capstone project location in particular. Um, so really thinking back to when we talked about identifying conservation champions in this program, looking you know, in that 44% of the school district that identifies Hispanic or Latino, who are some of those emerging leaders who are gonna be able to at least give us some intel into, you know, do you, do you not feel comfortable using trails? Um, why do you opt to not engage in outdoor recreation? What barriers may exist? What would help you become more involved um, in this sphere? So really trying to find those individuals and form relationships with them to uh, increase our just, yeah, increase the diversity of our trail user community. I think there's a lot of potential for that. All right. And now I'm just kind of talk about what this whole project and kind of um, time has taught me. So here is a picture of me as a lowly uh, SCA Corps member in the Salmon Chalice National Forest in 2018, um, doing some trail work out there in the Frank Church. 
And then, yeah, that's really what got me started in this kind of trail and outdoor recreation resource management world. Um, introduced me to opportunities with the Forest Service. This photo here on the right doesn't look like much, but these two individuals are uh, some of my good friends, Lisa and Naomi. We were all in that core together and actually the both of them have come back to work on the trail crew with me over um, the past couple of years. So I think that's really cool just to see um, the community that we've built and how we've been able to all apply these skills that we've learned as young core members and go out there and help our public lands. Um, so yeah, then the next year I was able to get a job with the Forest Service uh, working on the Catch and Make Professional Trail Crew. And that just taught me a lot about, you know, how hard I could work, the opportunities that were out there. I learned so much and so many different beef skills. And I think I um, had a lot of fun doing that, but definitely over the past, I say 18 months to two years, started to feel the itch to um, apply some of these skills and lessons learned into um, other areas. And so got to do a lot of chainsawing this summer up those skills. Also got to become a forest protection officer, uh, which I didn't use a lot, but it was still cool to just see all the different ways that um, you can serve your public lands and engage the public. Um, but definitely this summer was a really challenging summer in a lot of ways. Um, I was working part-time at the Forest Service and part-time doing this capstone project. And it was hard to kind of like mentally make the shift from an extremely field-based environment to like a very office-based environment. Um, again, I was also doing this project pretty independently without a lot of um, like day-to-day -day support. And it was also the first year of the project. So I was like kind of figuring out a lot of things as I was going. Um, and it was definitely some very difficult and challenging days, some very cold mornings and yeah. Um, but overall it was a good season. I'm really glad it happened. And I'm really glad that I got the opportunity to take all of the skills and experiences um, that I've been able to gain working for the Forest Service on Trails and kind of like build out this capstone project um, to really integrate that field-based work and that field-based knowledge with this um, experience that I've had here in CLTL. So yeah, I want to just thank um, yeah my project partner, Sarah, and I think you're watching maybe. If you're not, thank you, Sarah Gress, my boss, um, and all my Staff members at the Trails Coalition, uh, everyone at the Forest Service has helped me out, friends, family, you all. This has been really cool. I'm just really happy to see how this project turned out. I'm definitely really proud of it. Um, I consider myself a huge trail nerd at this point, and that's totally okay. But this was, um, I think, really a fun challenge for me to see how can I take these past experiences and really demonstrate how outdoor recreation does intersect with conservation in a really big and real way um, and apply it in a place-based setting. Yeah, in a community that I've come to call home and yeah, I feel really strongly about. So thank you so much for listening and I'll take any questions.